Last week, we studied parallel lines, which have been cut by transversal. And we looked at the relationships that exist between um, pairs of angles that are created. So this week, we want to actually work on some proofs regarding the relationships between certain pairs of angles. So in this proof, proof number two, uh, we're referring to the diagram that is below our two column chart. And we actually are asked to prove that angle three is congruent to angle five. And in this diagram, we're given that line N is parallel to line M. So indeed, what we do have here is parallel lines that have been cut by a transversal, and there are special angle relationships that are formed. And so it's our job to prove that angle three is congruent to angle five. Now, the way we're going to go about this proof is going to take just a little bit of creativity. To establish a relationship between angle three and angle five, what we first want to do is we want to explore the diagram and see if these two angles, angles three and five, are both related in some way to another angle. And then can we use this relationship that three and five have to another angle to establish uh, the fact that three and five are actually congruent. So I'm going to start with angle three and I'm just going to kind of explore some angles around three. So first of all, I could look at angles two and three and I could see that they form a linear pair, uh, but angle two doesn't seem to be related in any special way to angle five. Another angle that I could look at would be angle one. And I can see that angle three and angle one form a pair of vertical angles. And if we remember what we learned last week, angle one and angle five are actually corresponding angles because both angle one and angle five appear above a parallel line and to the left of the transversal. So they correspond to each other. And we learned that corresponding angles are congruent. So I have that angle three and angle one are congruent because they are vertical angles and angle one and angle five are congruent because they are corresponding angles. So this is a possibility. We could use angle one to establish some type of link between angles three and five. Since both angles three and five have a relationship with angle one. Uh, there's another angle we're going to look at as well though. We could find a similar relationship between angles three and five and angle seven. In this case, angles three and seven are corresponding angles because they both appear below a parallel line and they also appear to the right of the transversal. So angle three is congruent to angle seven and also uh, angle seven is congruent to angle five because uh, these two angles, five and seven, are vertical angles. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the relationships that exist between angles three, five, and seven to help us prove that angles three and five must be congruent. Uh, let's see. Let's kind of write down just kind of our observations, okay? Angle three is congruent to angle seven because 
their corresponding angles. And I'm just going to abbreviate the word corresponding. And then we have angle five is congruent to angle seven because they're vertical angles. So can we use these two statements to create a relationship between angle three and angle five? Because remember, we were asked to prove uh, that angle three is congruent to angle five. So these first steps of this proof require some creativity. We need to find some way to establish a relationship between angle three and five. And the way we're going to do that is by using angle seven. So let's go up to our two column proof and let's fill in the reasons. Remember at the beginning of the year, um, you'll typically be given the statements in a proof and then your, your job will be to supply the reasons for each statement. So the first statement tells us that line M and N are parallel, but this is what it is exactly given to us in our diagram. I have this statement highlighted in green in our diagram. And remember what we're given is always the first statement in our proof. Okay, so now steps two and three were kind of the creative steps. We're trying to establish a relationship between angle three and five, and we're going to do that via angle seven because both angle three and angle five are related to angle seven. So what we're going to do now is we're going to um, give reasons for each of these statements. So in statement two, we have that angle three is congruent to angle seven. And we already discussed that three and seven are corresponding angles. So that's why we can say that they're congruent. And if you look, um, you also have a reason bank that goes with this problem. And you're going to want to add um, these two reasons to your reason bank because you're actually going to need them to complete the proofs on this page. So we've just used the reason that corresponding angles are congruent as our reason for statement two. And in statement three, we are saying that angle seven is congruent to angle five. And if we look back at our diagram, we see that angle seven and five are vertical angles. And we know that vertical angles are congruent as well. Okay, so how does this establish, how do these two facts in statement two and statement three establish this relationship that's in statement four that says, because of the statements in two and three, it, it logically follows that angle three must be congruent to angle five. Okay, so to understand statement four and how we got it, we need to recall what the transitive property says. This is a property that's used over and over again in geometric proofs. Remember the transitive property says if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go back to our proof and I am going to call angle three A. And I think I'm gonna write it in a little bit um, thicker pen here. Okay, so angle three is my A. And remember, even though we have statements of equality here in the transitive property, which I've highlighted in yellow, we can just change the equal sign to a congruent symbol 
and use the transitive property for a statement of congruence as well. So angle three is my A and angle seven is my B. So I have A is congruent to B. So if A is congruent to B and B, remember I'm calling seven, angle seven, B, and B is congruent to C, then A must be congruent to C. This is one of the things you can do to help you see if the transitive property is being used in a proof. So here, three is A. Okay, if A is congruent to B and B is congruent to C, then A is congruent to C. So I'm just gonna try and highlight this so you can see that what we have going on here really is the transitive property. Okay, if A is congruent to B and B is congruent to C, then A must be congruent to C. Or we could say if angle three is congruent to angle seven and angle seven is congruent to angle five, then angle three must also be congruent to angle five. So, this statement four follows directly from statements two and three by the transitive property. Remember another way to think of the transitive property is to think that if we have two things, I'm going to highlight in pink. So I have two things and they are congruent to the same thing, which in this case is angle seven, then they must be congruent to each other. That's another way to remember the transitive property. Two things that are congruent to the same thing are congruent to each other. So because both angles three and five are congruent to angle seven, they have to be congruent to each other. There's one other thing I want to point out. Well, we used the transitive property as our reason for number four, we could also use the substitution property Remember when we were looking at the properties of equality, I told you that generally, anywhere you can use the transitive property, you can also use the substitution property. So in step two, we're told that um, angle three is congruent to angle seven. So that means that wherever we see angle seven, we could just replace it with angle three. So if I look down at step three, I see that I have angle seven mentioned right here. Since angle three is congruent to angle seven, I can just replace the angle seven in statement three with angle three since they, they are congruent to each other. And so that's another way of looking at how we got from step three to step four. Another way to look at it is to say that since in step two, we know that angle three and angle seven are the same, I can just replace angle seven in step three with um, angle three. So if you compare statements three and four, the only difference between the two of them is that in statement three, I have an angle seven, and in statement four, I have an angle three. So I just replaced angle seven with angle three. So another reason for this could be the substitution property.
So the whole key to this proof was finding another angle that both three and five are related to, and then use that relationship that angles three and five have with angle seven to establish a relationship between angle three and angle five. Because both angles three and five are congruent to angle seven, they have to be congruent to each other. So we've proved that angle three and five are congruent. And what we have actually shown is that anytime we have parallel lines that are cut by a transversal, alternate interior angles will always be congruent. This is another theorem uh, that's related to parallel lines and transversals. So what our result in proof two tells us is that we know by the same reasoning that angle four and angle six will also be congruent to each other because they are also alternate interior angles. Alternate interior angles are always congruent. <laughs>